never been before. It's the first time. It's just I'm so glad that he's opening our minds to the reality around us. The world has got a lot of problems at the moment. I think even the people who are taking news from the main media are aware of a lot of problems out there. And the real way that we can solve them is by opening up awareness. And things like this event are going to do that. A friend of mine died of having swine flu vaccine recently. So I want to help as many people realise that um, you know, this world that we're living in is not what we thought it is, and it's quite important that we um, get the word out. I do believe there is an evil cabal who are interested in power, money and control, and I have a lot of respect for David for not being scared and speaking out against it. I admire him. I think he's very brave. I just want to see, see him doing his, his thing. I want David to, to tell us all, man, you know. I want him to talk about the, uh, the moon being a spaceship. I want him to talk about the future, which he's so positive about, you know, with the with the, what's coming and how humanity is going to remember who it is, you know, and, and see that fork in the road where we actually stop believing all the mainstream education and media and, and start to wake up to the, the true magnitude of who we are and how we create reality, you know. He's done a lot of quality research and he's also applied a kind of philosophy to it as well. You can take it or leave it, but he's putting it out there for everyone and he puts himself at risk of doing it and we won't in big time for that. Ladies and gentlemen, David Icke. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Whoa. Thank you. Thank you. Good turnout then. Crikey. I remember talking to um, people in uh, telephone boxes once and having room to walk around all those years ago. But amazing things have happened since. My thanks first of all to the extraordinary Linda for putting this event on and Sean and all the team. And my God, it's 20 years since my head blew off. 20 years on, I hope I've contributed one thing, and that is to let people realize that if you believe in something, if you keep putting one foot in front of the other and don't get caught in defending yourself or feeling sorry for yourself or falling for the fear that what other people think of you because you're saying something that's different, then if you keep putting that one foot in front of the other, you get somewhere. It's when you stop that everything stops. And if we believe in what we are saying, and what we're saying has validity, then eventually it will be shown to be so. But that process only plays out if we keep walking. And you realize over 20 years that whatever people are saying about you today, they'll say something else tomorrow, so don't get caught up in what they're saying today, whatever today is. Because the fear of what other people think is the state of perception that stops people making a difference. Because you can only make a difference in a world of uniformity if you operate outside that uniformity, and that's always going to get you laughter, it's always going to get you ridicule and condemnation. 
And we either want to make a difference and we take that on and say whatever, or we don't, in which case nothing changes. And when I look back at this last 20 years, I, I can see very clearly in my life what, what happens to all of us. You come into the world and then you go through a series of experiences and they seem to be random. They don't seem to be connected. Well, this is happening now and that's happening then and this is happening today. But when you look back, you see how it's been a journey of connected, often fantastically synchronistic experiences that are leading us in a certain direction. If we choose to go, if we don't choose to go, then we just run on the spot, which is where most of humanity is because of the way the system is structured. So when I look at the different aspects of my life, I see the chain of events that's led to now. I mean, this was me when I came into the world. I was bloody happy to be here, I was. <laughs> Mom, Earth's a shitty place, we want to go home. And I felt like that as a kid, to be honest. But then my life unfolded and I became a professional footballer. Have you seen them teeth? When I saw that bloody picture, I've seen them teeth. Last time I saw a set of teeth like that, it was winning the Grand National. <laughs> but the football side of it, which just seemed to be, I want to be a footballer. Actually, because I ended up playing professional football with rheumatoid arthritis, not recommended, by the way, I developed, had to, an iron will to keep going whatever. And my goodness me, that came in quite handy a few years later. Then I went into television. What a bloody poser, look at him. I don't know, he should curl me air then, you know. And thank you. <laughs> it's been a long time since anyone did that to me. In fact, that's the first time, I think. And what that did was show me the inside of the media, shite and also gave me a, a public profile which was going to lead to something later that wouldn't be ignored, although at the time I wish it was being ignored. And then I went into politics, you can call Green Party politics, and I saw politics from the inside, how it's just a game, how it's irrelevant to human life, and how people who were fighting with each other in the public arena were doing anything but that behind the scenes. And then, bang, 1990. For a year before 1990, when I was still in the Green Party, I felt this presence around me. Even when uh, I was in a room alone, or especially then, I felt this presence around me like I wasn't alone. And this went on for the best part, like I say, of a year. And it got more and more powerful, more and more tangible. Long story short, I tell the, the, the story in the books, I went by a series of synchronistic chances to see a psychic, never seen one in my life before, and I just wanted to go along, I told her I wanted hands-on healing for my arthritis, which was true, but the real reason was, would she pick up what was around me? And I went for a couple of times, and it was hands-on healing, very nice, Betty Shine, nice lady, and then the third time, she starts giving me this stuff. Ooh, this is powerful, she says. I've got to close my eyes for this one. And in 1990, out came all this stuff. I'm, I'm presenting the, the, the snooker at the time. You know, I'm, I'm with the BBC still, and out came all this stuff. I was going to go out on a world stage. I was going to reveal great secrets. And basically, there was a shadow across the world that had to be lifted. There was a story that had to be told. And um, I was going to, to tell it which when I'm sitting with my bum on that little bench next to her in her healing room uh, sounded complete bloody craziness. But it's unfolded. And it's unfolded very quickly after that where my life started to change. And I started to come across information that was pushing me in a certain direction. And then in the same year, or just after the same year, 1991, I went to Peru on a, just on a whim on intuition and ended up having extraordinary experiences 
on a mound in Peru, just down from where that is. This is Siustani, uh, not far from a place called Puno in southern Peru. Over just out the shot there on this mound, when this energy was coming in the top of my head, and I was shaking like I was plugged in the mains for about the best part of an hour. And after that, everything changed. It was like a dam bursting in my head, and suddenly concepts, information, perceptions were pouring, pouring into my, into my mind. And for about three months, if you'd have asked what planet I was on, I would definitely have had to check. And that three months was when all this unfolded, what I call my turquoise period. When it was like a computer where you push too many keys and it freezes and says, can't process this, thank you, I'm shutting down. And that's what happened to me basically in that three months. And then, after that time, everything morphed back. And people were coming up to me in the street after all the ridicule, they're saying, you're just like the bloke I used to know. I thought they said you'd gone mad. Well, I may have looked like the bloke I used to know, they used to know, but I wasn't. I was suddenly seeing the world in a completely different way, and I was asking the big questions. Who are we? Where are we? Why is the world as it is? And from that time, the puzzle pieces started to be handed to me in really synchronistic, amazingly synchronistic ways. One of the, if you like, psychic communications that came through Betty Shine said in 1990, sometimes he will say things and wonder where they came from. They will be our words. Another one said knowledge will be put into his mind and at other times he will be led to knowledge. Well, all, all I can say after 20 years of experience since that time is that that famous advert in Britain, it does exactly what it says on the tin, is precisely what has unfolded since then. And that's how the information for all the books and everything has come. Another one was arduous seeking is not necessary. The path is already mapped out. You only have to follow the clues. Again, it says, uh, or it does what it says on the tin. Exactly that has happened. And it's this process of having insights and then five sense information, names, dates, places, documents, people coming to support that insight. That is what has been unfolding for 20 years. That's where the information has come from um, in the books. And it's been like some, some force has been handing me puzzle pieces um, in virtually the order easiest to understand them. And when you put the puzzle pieces together, the world looks very, very different when you connect the dots. Because what the system wants to do right across society is get people to focus on dots, individual dots, a religion, family, job, football team, whatever. There's nothing wrong with focus as long as you hold peripheral vision and you can see how your focus connects out into other things. That's not what the system wants, it wants that. That focus so you don't have peripheral vision. And as you're trying to go through the maze we call life, the control system has set up endless ways to divert us, confuse us, and to keep us from the understanding that would set us free. And that's what I want to talk about in the first section today. The idea is to keep humanity constantly bewildered so we don't know where we are, who we are, what even reality is. But when you connect the dots, and so many of them, as we'll see today, have on the face of it no connection to some of the others, when you connect the dots, the light goes on, and suddenly the picture forms. And what I'm going to do today, I can't fill in endless detail to support what I'm saying, that's in the books then that's what books are for, because even in the long, long day that we've got today, and all the hours I'm going to be speaking, I need that time just to connect uh, individual dots and show how they connect together, because that will make the world we live in phenomenally different to the one that sold us from cradle to grave. The elephant in the living room appears when you connect the dots, when you connect enough, the elephant is it's so blatant. But when the dots are unconnected, there's no elephant there. Because you can't see it. And that elephant in the living room 
is that there is a multi-level conspiracy, and it is multi-level, to enslave humanity in like a global concentration camp. The trick is to make sure the slaves don't realize they're slaves so they don't do anything about their slavery. Although as this moves and moves towards its uh, goal, that is becoming more obvious. When I first uh, started on this journey 20 years ago, the first few years, all the information coming to me in the, like I say, incredible synchronicity of meeting people, seeing documents, coming across uh, information, having experiences, that first few years were about what I call the five cents level of this conspiracy. The banking scams, the police state, the Orwellian surveillance, the big pharmaceutical cartel attack on the human body and the human immune system, engineered wars. And then after a few years, I started to move through the synchronicity, just following the clues as it said at the start, I came across this reptilian uh, connection to the families that are running our reality. And then the most important part from about 2003, 2002, when the synchronicity started taking me in to the nature of reality itself. And until we understand at least the themes of what this illusion is, we can understand nothing else about the world as it is and the way that the control system works. And then, over the last year, that synchronicity and the puzzle pieces has taken me into, perhaps for many people, I understand it, the most extraordinary area, which is that the moon is not what we think it is. Now, can you imagine if you've come along today out of curiosity. <laughs> We're a few minutes in, and your eyes are on... Bill, he just said reptile, he couldn't have done, he did, I heard him. Funny. <laughs> well, we're going to get into some strange stuff, especially in the second uh, section. Well, the first section is strange. We really are lunatics for reasons that I'll, I'll come to. So we're now at this fork in the road where we can go down one track and we can experience freedom in a way that we've never even understood what freedom is. We go down the other one, the one that the control system wants, then we're heading for a Orwellian fascist global state. It's unfolding as I speak. That choice, that fork in the road, is to become conscious because most of humanity isn't because it's manipulated not to be or the control system's route which is just to become a clone a computer terminal of a control system a merciless control system the choice is between this not too far down the road if we allow it and this good in it which one Ugh. freedom on an, a level, like I say, that we can't even begin to imagine from the perception of awareness that we've had so far. We perceive just a fraction of what freedom is, even when we talk about freedom. And we can break out of this. We can break out of this maze, this vibrational prison that we've been en encased in. But to do that, as I said at the start, we have to stop doing what has put us in there. And that is conforming to the world that we are told the world is. Stop being in the herd. Stop being in the box because there is another way. And if we don't take another way, I'm not saying the other way, we live in all possibility. But if we don't take another way from the way we've taken this far, how can anything change? It can't. If, you've always, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. Real simple. And we don't have to all be the same. You can look the other way. You don't have to be a faceless person in a faceless crowd. It's not compulsory. You can express your uniqueness. 
You don't have to do what everybody else does just because they do it and we're frightened of conforming. And sometimes the uh, choice of not conforming can actually save us a lot of grief and it will in the next few years. You don't have to swim with the tide. You can swim the other way. It's possible. You were born an original. Don't die a copy. But how many people do? Because they fear not being like everyone else is because of the comeback from those people. Truth does not change because it is or is not believed by the majority of the people. Everybody knows that, mate. Everyone knows that's rubbish. Well, I don't know it's rubbish. That's one less than everyone. We've made a start. As Gandhi said, even if you're in a minority of one, the truth is still the truth. The multitude is always wrong. My goodness, how history has confirmed that. And this is the stadium on which it all plays out. The human mind. You cannot control billions of people physically. You can in certain small areas, yes, with your tanks and your bloody tasers and all that rubbish, but you can't do it to seven billion. You have to control the way they perceive themselves and the world and therefore through that make them behave the way you want them to. So if we're going to go down this route of freedom, first of all, we need to free our minds from the programming of a lifetime. Free our minds from the belief that what we're programmed to believe in schools is the truth about anything. It's not there to enlighten us, it's there to program us with a certain perception of reality which we carry through our lives so we will be good little slaves based on who we think we are and what we think the world is. Free our minds from the diversions and the nonsense and hey honey she's after the car quick and while we're doing that over here the world is being orchestrated not for our benefit either free our minds from the belief that the mainstream media is interested in telling the people the truth of what's out going on in the world it's there to do the opposite. It's to tell us the version of reality the control system wants us put to believe so we will respond and react in the right way. Free our minds from the fake change people. I mean, crikey, is there a politician that's actually campaigning anymore that's not saying they stand for change? Change? Yes, I'll tell you what the change is. It's one guy claiming to be changed, controlled by the same force that controlled the previous guy. Free our minds from the fake, fraudulent, false flag terrorist events created by the same control system that then tells you how the world must change to save us from the terrorism that they had covertly created. Free our minds from the front men for this control system who are put up to frighten us into uh, accepting changes in society, surveillance and control to save us from people who are front men for the very system that says, let me save you from him. Free our minds from the bullshit nonsense about human-caused global warming, which is nothing more than a, a, a way of introducing and justifying more and more controls and massive, massive increases in taxation making fortunes for people like him. Free our minds from the idea that Big Pharma, the pharmaceutical industry, is in any way interested in human health. It's not about human health, it's about Big Pharma wealth and more. Free our minds from the four-letter word that controls the world, fear, that traps us in these vibrational boxes called fear. And free our minds more than anything else from the idea that we are Charlie Jones or Ethel Smith. We're just Joe Public. We've got no power. The choice is to become conscious, to realize that Ethel Smith is an experience, not who we are, and choose not to be what the control system is fast trying to create. Since I started writing about this, 
in some detail 15, 16, 17 years ago about the control system. It's, it's, gone, it's gone from its coming to daily experience. I think this is a symbolic picture myself. That plaque says, George Orwell lived here. <laughs> We've got peaceful demonstrations in America being scattered by excruciatingly painful sound technology. The microchip agenda's moving on. The sky's full of chemtrails and all the stuff that's in them. The food we are given to eat, if we choose to eat it, is full of uh, chemical cocktails that are destabilizing our ability to think straight and be emotionally stable. And they're targeting the children more than anyone because they're the ones that are supposed to live most of their lives in this control system. They bloody won't, as I'll get to later, but they're trying. And yet so many people are still saying, well, it looks all right to me. Looks all right to me. To have your head in the sand, you have to be on your knees. The two go together. <laughs> ain't, it great, ain't it great to be free? See, the idea is to enslave us while people think they're free. And this is a, this is a real important area that keeps us from focusing on this and act, acting on this. Wishful thinking. Wishful thinking that says, well... I don't want it to be true, so I'm going to kid myself it's not. And if I can do that, then I don't have to do anything. Here's an example of uh, wishful thinking I came across. Wishful thinking that this threat will make any difference to their husband's drinking. That's wishful thinking. <laughs> when I first saw that, I immediately ordered a large one, personally. But <laughs> well, that's wishful thinking. I wish it were different. I wish things were different. Well, we all do, but they're not. They are as they are, and I find myself saying this all the time now. It is what it is. And if you accept what it is, you can change what it is. If you're in denial of it, you're not going to change it because you're kidding yourself it doesn't exist. This control system is coming in. It's coming in fast at the moment. And we have to get it from talking about it to doing something about it. And it's crept up on us step by step while we're watching the game shows and celebrity world and sport and stuff. Nothing wrong with any of those things. But if you're there and you've not got the peripheral vision, they will keep you from seeing what's going on. And now the future is here. It's not sometime, never. The future is here. And we've got to go from that to that pretty damn quick. And we can and we will in many, many ways. As Martin Luther King said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. And we are at a time of challenge and controversy, and we'll see what we're bloody made of, frankly. But the great news is, and I'm going to get into this big time in the last section, this is a time of fantastic awakening. You know, like I say, when I started on this journey consciously, anyway, 20 years ago, the number of people that were in any way interested in this information, whether it's the nature of reality or, or the, 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 the control system and its agenda, was tiny, tiny, tiny. It was a lonely road. Not anymore. A phenomenal, phenomenal awakening is happening all over the world as people start to expand their minds and open their minds to another possibility, to another world, to another sense of self. And what comes with that awakening. Indeed, what triggers it in so many ways is when we decide to ask the big questions. Because only then can we get the big answers. Like, who are we? Where are we? What is reality? And that's what I'm going to focus on in this first section. Because unless we at least understand the themes of what reality is, we cannot possibly, possibly understand what's happening in the world and how the control system really works and how deep the rabbit hole goes. Establishment science, education, media, that's what it does. I mean, have you seen these politicians in Britain now? You've got Clegg uh, in the Liberal Party, Liberal Democrats. You've got 
Cameron in the Conservatives, you're going to probably have one of the Milibands, maybe David Miliband, leader of the other major party, and they're all standing on the same stod in postage stamp, all three of them. Same background, same basic perception of the world and politics, and that's exactly the same with science, education, and media. They all stand on this same postage stamp, and anyone wants to step off it and explore in other areas, stop him, stop him! Ridicule, condemnation, stop his funding. And people say, well, if what you're saying is true, science would tell us. Yeah, okay, like the media would tell us, right? Yeah, okay. What the control system doesn't want us to know is that this reality, in terms of its physicality, the one we think we're experiencing now, is an illusion. There is no physicality. There is no out there. Everything I'm looking at now out there is going on in here. I'll come to how that works. It is so simple. As the great American comedian Bill Hicks said, great, great man. All matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration. We're all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There's no such thing as death. Life is only a dream, and we are the imagination of ourselves. And that's the control system's bottom line, manipulating our imagination of self. You can trick the brain into seeing things that aren't there. These are pictures of paintings, etc., on the flat surface, the flat road, the flat pavement. And yet you can trick the brain into reading them as three-dimensional. That's on a flat pavement. So is that. Is that a woman's face, or is it a flower and a butterfly? Very easy to trick the brain to decode reality in a certain way. For instance, is this a man and a hand, or is it a Mexican, a woman, a bush, and a dog? Depends how you decode it. And the control system, en masse, is manipulating 24-7 the way that we decode reality. So we decode it in line with what suits the control system. As Einstein said, reality is an illusion, albeit a persistent one. And the reason it's persistent is because we live in a virtual reality universe. A fantastically expanded, advanced version of a gigantic computer game. And the analogies go one after the other. Today, it's much easier to talk about reality because technology is starting to mirror the very reality that we're experiencing. It's getting closer and closer to real. And the projection is that not too long from now, they will have computer games which you could hardly tell the difference between that and this. We're having training simulations and flying simulations. They're in some hospitals using virtual reality images to show patients when their burns are being treated, and they, they show them very, very pictures, very, very cold images, and the brain decodes that and cools the skin down. And when you look at these advanced virtual reality technologies, what are they doing? They're just hijacking the way the five senses work anyway. They're using the eyes, they're using through these gloves, the, the, the sense of touch and all the rest of it. And they are feeding information, digital information, to the brain and tricking it to believe that something's going on which is not. And that's what the, how the control system works. And we have what I call the body computer, the biological body computer. Biological, by, by that I mean it has the ability not just to react to data, but to uh, assess that data and make decisions on it, which is what the immune system is doing all now as we speak. I'm not standing here, you're not sitting there saying, okay, uh, problem with the right leg, go down there, bit on the left. No, it's just doing it because it's thinking. It's a biological computer system. By the way, this uh, image here was taken the split second that someone told this guy that Barack Obama had won the Nobel Peace Prize. That's how I reacted anyway. And the base foundation of this virtual reality is actually waveform, vibrating energy. 
And within waveforms, as scientists will tell you, fantastic amounts of information can be stored. And that's what the base information construct of this reality is. It's information in wave form. And what I'm going to call that through the day is the metaphysical universe. When I talk about the metaphysical universe, I mean the waveform level of this universe before it becomes this. What happens is the waveform information construct is decoded through the body computer into the world that we think we are experiencing. It's all going on in here. And it's like, as I'll come to in a second, it's almost a mirror, though much more advanced, of the wireless internet, where you can get a computer and you can pull the wireless internet, the World Wide Web, a whole collective reality, out of the unseen to appear on a screen anywhere in the world. And so as we decode vibrational information through to electrical information, which is uh, sent to the brain, and the brain decodes that into the world that we think we are experiencing. This is the metaphysical universe. Through the body computer, it becomes the world that we experience as outside of us. The five senses, which of course, as I say, virtual reality computer games lock into, that's how they work, they change vibrational information into electrical information which goes to the brain to be decoded into what is holographic information. I'll come to that. So this is absolutely right, this, this scene from The Matrix, where the Neo character says, this isn't real, and Morpheus says, what is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, taste, and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. That's all it is. And imagine if you can manipulate the way the brain interprets reality because you know how reality works and the population doesn't because you bloody well keep it from them systematically. The five senses are a decoding system. The most obvious one, of course, is sound. That's a vibration comes to the ear, message to the brain, brain hears the sound. There is no sound until we've decoded it as so. Sound is just a vibration until we've decoded it. Sound exists in here. Same with taste. Electrical signals to the brain decodes it. This is how you can, through stage hypnotists, etc., get someone to eat a potato but taste an apple. Because you implant the belief here that it's an apple, and so the uh, electrical signal with the, the potato code goes there, and it doesn't read it like that. It reads it as an apple. Even on that basic level, think of the potential for manipulating the way we see reality individually and collectively. And different parts of the brain, like with smell, are specifically there in the body computer to decode uh, those senses. Same with touch, exactly the same. Even movement. There is no movement until we've decoded that movement. There are uh, conditions of the brain, which some people have, where they don't decode movement. So often they don't even see it. They'll see a car in the distance, the next thing, whoom, it's gone. Nothing in the middle. They see someone pouring a, a, a cup of tea, and all they see is a static arc of tea. It's all an illusion. It's a computer game. A very, very sophisticated one. I love that. Crikey. Talk about having a laugh. Hey, Ethel, come and see who's in the telly. <laughs> Don't you mean on the telly? No. Stage hypnotists are playing with this system all the time, like I say. And there are some other hypnotists I made earlier. These don't know they're hypnotists, most of them anyway. But that's what they're doing. They are, all the time, giving us a sense of reality, a belief in what is real. And if the brain takes on that belief system, it then starts reading reality in line with that belief, and it becomes a self-fulfilling reality. So we live in the equivalent, as I'll keep saying, a very, very advanced equivalent, of the holographic uh, internet, the World Wide Web. 
If you say to people, tell me about the internet, they say, yeah, well, it's graphics and websites and words and colors and the pictures. Yes, it is. But the only place that exists in that form, the internet, is on the screen. Everywhere else, it's electrical circuits, etc., etc. You say, tell me about television. They'll say, well, it's moving pictures on a screen. Yes, it is. But the only place that television exists in that, in that form is on the screen. Everywhere else, it's electrical circuits and in some cases still, many cases still, broadcast frequencies. And we live in a, what I call the cosmic internet, where information in the energy around us, I'll come to where it comes from in a minute, is then pulled out of the uh, unseen. Just as these guys sitting out in the open, no wires, no connections, they are pulling the unseen out onto the computer screen. And if you think of it, because people say, well, if you're creating your own reality in your head and all that stuff, why do we all see the same stage? Why do we all see the same car? Well, when you log on the internet in South Africa or Australia or London or America or anywhere, apart from places like China, you log on to the very same collective reality as everywhere else, everywhere in the world. You might choose to go to this website, and if you go to this website, the guy in South Africa will be could go to the same website that you're on and see the same thing because it's a collective reality. What happens is that we then decide, do we like this website? What do we think of it? Do I want to go there or do I want to go there? That's how we put our individual spin on it. It's the same when you look out the, the window and you see the same car going past. But I might like the car, someone else might not like the car. But it's the same collective reality. And the body computer is pulling this reality out of the unseen, just like uh, those laptops. And so you've got in the Matrix movie that scene where he says, the Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us, even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out of your window or you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? that you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch, a prison for your mind. I'll get into the nature of that prison in the second section. So what is this universe? It's information. And it's information decoding information. Just as you put um, a computer disk in a computer, it's information. The information encoded in the computer then reads the information on the disk. That's what we're doing. And that way, we manifest this apparently out there reality. We too, the, the so-called human body, is energetic, non-physical in its base form. But when it comes through the decoding system, it becomes the world that we think we're experiencing outside, <clears throat> outside of us. It seems to be outside, outside of us, I'll grant you, my God, I look out here, it looks to be outside of me, but it's inside of us. We are creating it through the decoding system in our heads. Now, I'll go into this, go into this area in, 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 in the new book. What I'm saying is that, well, I'm not saying this, scientists are now saying this. At the center of this galaxy is a massive black hole, and the increasing thinking is, and I would say it fits perfectly, is that there is a giant black hole at the center of every galaxy. What I'm saying is this, these black holes resonate the base information or the base vibrational frequency of this virtual reality universe. And they interact with what we call the suns. In this case, our sun in this solar system, but of course there's suns all over the place. I'm saying that this vibration triggers from the suns, depending on its vibrational state, because it changes, and that answers a lot of things, as I'll come to shortly. It triggers information of certain kinds being transmitted by the sun, the suns in general, in the form of photons. Photons are the base uh, unit of what we call light and other forms of electromagnetic radiation. They carry information. These photons being generated out of the suns, triggered by this vibrational base frequency uh, coming from the black holes, create the cosmic wireless internet within our reality. And that's what we are decoding 
The Earth decodes it. It's photon energy, photon information that is passing through the Earth energy grid. It is photon information, what the Chinese, in their acupuncture uh, disciplines call qi. That qi is actually photon energy. It is information, which the body computer then is decoding into this collective reality. And just like on the internet, where you can see information and receive it, but you can also post information, so we're interacting with this virtual reality universe and changing it subtly as we put our unique spin on things. And we're creating that world that I keep talking about. Now, some scientists over the years have postulated that this physical world only exists when it's observed. I agree. Why? Because of this. When you put a computer disk into a computer, it does not read all the information on the disk at the same time. It reads that part that it is observing, whatever that laser is hitting at the time. All the other stuff is still in information form. It's not been transferred to the screen as pictures, etc. And we do the same. When we observe, decode, then we bring it into this reality. But without that, this is just the base vibrational metaphysical universe, which is the base of, basis of all of it. Then no light gets in the brain. So how do we see light? How can I look at that light and see it? No light ever gets in the brain because the brain's decoding information into that light. So when you see things like in the Matrix movies, those, those lines like, there is no spoon. It is not the spoon that bends, it is only yourself. Exactly. Because the only place the spoon exists in physical form is in here. And you bend it by bending the way you decode reality. Miracles are simply overcoming the programming of what's possible and not possible. You know, we of course program to believe that when you walk through fire, you get burned. And if you walk through fire or hot coals with that belief, that decoding state, you'll burn your bloody feet. But as so many people have shown, if you can go into another state of consciousness and override that, you can walk across hot coals and not feel a thing. Why? Because an illusion cannot burn an illusion unless you believe it can. There are no miracles. There's just understanding how to manifest all possibility. And that understanding comes from the fact that we acknowledge, we understand that we are consciousness. Disembodied, no form, awareness, having an experience. Like a Central American shaman said, we are perceivers, we are awareness, we are not objects, we have no solidity. We, or rather our reason, forget this, and thus we entrap the totality of ourselves in a vicious circle from which we rarely emerge in our lifetime. And that vicious circle is what the control system wants to keep us in, because then we're controllable. If we understand who we really are, what we really are, it's impossible to control by a, a bunch of control freaks. The body is the way our awareness experiences this reality. If I want to interact with this reality, which is a, a, a frequency range, I have to have an outer shell, we all do, that vibrates within this frequency range, because our consciousness is vibrating much too quickly. It's like Radio 1 trying to make a uh, connection to Radio 2. They're on different wavelengths, never going to happen. So we take on this outer projection we call a body, and therefore I can pick this up and interact with this reality. What the control system wants us to do is to believe that that projection, that vehicle to experience this reality is who we are, because then we go from, I am all that is, has been, and ever will be. I'm Charlie Smith. I'm Ethel Jones. I've got no power. It's the whole bottom line of it. We say I'm going on the internet. We don't go on the internet. The computer goes on the internet, and we observe the internet through the computer. And our mind-body 
is the vehicle to experience this reality. That goes on the internet. Consciousness, the real us, observes, just like the World Wide Web, observes the internet through that vehicle. And like I say, the idea is to get us to think that we're that and not that. I had a, a vision when I was sitting in the bath a couple of years ago now, maybe. And I've asked my, my great friend, uh, the brilliant Neil Haig, to uh, knock this up from what I saw. I'm sitting in my bath, and I saw billowing energy, yellow, kind of white yellow energy. And I took that immediately to be consciousness. Then an eye appeared in the energy, the consciousness, and then a telescope appeared. At the end of the telescope was this reality, the Earth, the solar system, whatever. The last movement was for the telescope to morph into a human body. And that was so profound in the sense of that's how it works. And because of the limitations of this focus, we see ourselves, if we don't stay in contact with that, in very limited terms. Death is just putting the telescope down. Well, I've had enough of that. Earth's a shitty place. Hello, all right, I'm back. You never went away. The computer's here. We are observing through the computer. And I want to make the difference, because this will go through the day, the difference between consciousness and what I call the mind. Everything is the same energy in the end, because it's just one unified awareness I call the infinite. But it takes different expressions. Consciousness is the ocean. All possibility, all that is. All awareness. And the mind is like a frozen, denser expression of that. And therefore has great, great limitations in terms of awareness and perception compared with that. And one of the reasons is to interact with this reality, which is much denser than consciousness, it ha we have to have a denser conduit, which we call the mind-body. Therefore, it has to be more limited than consciousness itself. This guy, uh, Ramana Maharshi, a man who lived in India and meditated for most of his life on a mountain in India. I've actually been there. Nice place. He said, mind is consciousness which is put on limitations. You are originally unlimited and perfect. Later, you take on limitations and become the mind. Or as uh, Einstein put it, a human being is part, a part of the whole called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts, his feeling, as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. And that optical delusion comes from looking through the lens, the telescope. And what it does, and I keep saying the control system is structured exactly to do this, it puts us in a false identity. One that doesn't think all possibility, it thinks limitation, I can't, that's not possible. And if you want to control people en masse, you want them in that mode. I'm not David Icke. David Icke's my experience. It's a name for the experience I'm having at the moment. I am all consciousness, all awareness, all that is, has been, and ever will be, and so is everyone else in this room, everyone else in all the realities of this infinite world that we live in. We are all possibility, and that's our base state. I don't care who you are, what you are, what you've done in your life, what regrets you have, how successful you've been, your base state is all possibility. And I, I've only taken psychoactive drugs once, well, one and a half times. The main one was in Peru when I took something called ayahuasca in 2003. And for five hours, I had this voice, as loud as mine is now, took a female form, talking to me about the illusory nature of reality. And when I came back out uh, to, to Britain, it happened in the Brazilian rainforest, I started following up names, dates, places type information, what I was told. And it was extraordinarily accurate. It's amazing that mainstream science has sussed most of this, but doesn't realize it as, because the two, all the disciplines don't talk to each other. When you connect the dots, you realize they've already uh, established that this is an illusion. But that doesn't go down well because it's too close to the truth.
And what, how I experience that state beyond this world, beyond vibration, was a stillness and silence. And that's what all possibility is, the stillness and the silence. There was a great line that that voice, that voice said to me when it was explaining the nature of reality. It said, if it vibrates, it's illusion. If it vibrates, it's illusion, because our core level is stillness and silence. I experienced that. Amazing feeling. There are no negative emotions, there's no fear, there's no worry about not making the rent and all this stuff. They've all gone in that realm. And people think of nothing. All that is, has been, whatever can be. That's all potential, all knowing. And Everywhere and nowhere. People think that's a paradox. You can't be everywhere and nowhere, but you can in all possibility. In all possibility, everything is possible. So everywhere is nowhere. Nowhere is everywhere. Everything and nothing. Again, not a paradox. All possibility is everything and nothing. And as I was saying, we, we, we think of nothing as nothing's there. There's, there. There is nothing. But within the nothing, within the silence, is everything. Within the silence, for instance, is all possibility. And then when I start talking, I have pulled one possibility out of all possibility, which is manifest as vibration, my voice. And then I stop. It goes back into all possibility. We don't think that this building is defined by the nothing. We think it's defined by the something. But the something is only there, and this building is only in its, pre is in its form because of the no thing, apparently no thing, in between what we perceive as the something. The silence. Is, this is why when people are in silence, they go somewhere else. And so many people are frightened of the silence. Get in the car, whack the record on, get in home, put the telly on, noise, noise, hold you in five cents reality. When people go into the silence, that's when they get their insights because they're accessing other levels of themselves beyond the five senses. So out of the no-thing comes the realm of form. This is something called cymatics. If you go on the uh, um, internet, you can see it, uh, videos of it, like YouTube. What they, what they do is they put particles on a metal plate and they play sound across it. And it's incredible. It just forms into these amazing geometrical shapes just because of the sound. And when the sound stops, boom, it all goes back to all over the place. And then the sound changes and another form comes in. And these worlds of form, frequencies, vibrating frequencies, are created in this way, out of all possibility. And there are endless, infinite realms with different so-called laws of physics, different challenges, different experiences, all vibrating at different speeds and therefore able to share the same space. All of these different realms are sharing the same space that I'm sharing now, just as all the radio and television stations broadcasting to this city are sharing the space that I'm sharing now and the space that they're sharing with each other. So we live in a frequency range. And that frequency range is dictated by the range of frequencies that our body computers can decode. And it is extraordinarily tiny. We're virtually blind in terms of what exists. The vast majority of this universe is what scientists call dark energy or dark matter. And they call it dark, not because it's pitch black, but because we cannot decode it Therefore, it is not in our realm of experience. We have to work it out by its impact on things that we can see. And the electromagnetic spectrum is 0.005% of what is projected to exist in this universe. And visible light, which is the only frequency range that we can decode, is a fraction of the 0.005%. So this is it. Visible light, this is our world. And we look out and we think we can see everything. But we can't. We can see what we can decode. And therefore, we operate within a dimension, we might call it, and it's penetrated by other dimensions, which allows those other dimensions 
to interact with ours, which I'm going to get to in the second section, because that is fundamental to the control system. What we're doing is we are putting our focus of attention into this reality through the body computer, and therefore this seems to be the only world that exists. But the space we're occupying is teeming, teeming with life of endless varieties. So if we come into this world of mind, and we hold a connection to consciousness, we are in this world physically, and we can experience this. We're going to go down the pub, yeah, that's our beer with the air. Yeah. But we're not of this world in terms of the point of observation. We are in this world, but we're observing it from here. We can see things here that this can't see. And that's why the control system has to keep us here. And a structured society to make that happen. To keep us in bewilderment by being only able to decode and experience reality through the five senses. And once you are in the five senses, and you're not getting inspiration, insight, intuitive knowing from higher levels of your consciousness, where do you look to get a fix on who you are, where you are, and the world you're living in? There. And who controls that? The control system that controls the media, politics, education, science, the idea is isolate us in the five senses, isolate us in body-mind, and then program the body-mind to see the world that suits the control system. Time and space are just information within the metaphysical universe fabric, the vibrational fabric, which we then decode into what appears to be time and space. There is no time and space. When you put a disk in a computer, it's got information on it. You put it in the, in, in the computer, the computer reads it. On the screen, you see time and space, or what appears to be time and space. But all it is is information on the disk being read by the computer and being put on the screen. That's what we, we are doing all the time. Time's an illusion. And my goodness me, if we fall for that, then uh, we totally get encompassed by time, that time exists, you can, you can, you can say it's, it's one o'clock, I've got to meet someone at one o'clock, so you're there at the same time, and you synchronize that, but all, the, all, all along, you, you know that it's just, it's just a construct. It's not, it's not part of you this time. Because no time is where consciousness operates. And if we operate completely connected to time, then by that very nature, we're going to disconnect from consciousness, which is on another level of perception. Our time is just crazy. Uh, you cross a, an invisible line in the ocean, you go into tomorrow, you go the other way, you go into yesterday. There is only the now. That's all there is. And people say, no, no, there's the past and there's the future. Well, okay. When you think of the future, where are you? You're in the now. When you think of the past, memories, where are you? You're in the now. These are constructs. These are perceptions, they're not real. Only thing that's real is now. Everything happens in the now. And the only moment we can change anything is in the now. And if we get pulled into the past, all regret, I wish I had, ooh, that woman in 1953, ooh. Or we get pulled into the future, oh my God, what's going to happen? Oh, yeah, outcome, oh, what if, what if, what if? Then we're getting pulled out of the only time that exists, and therefore our power to change things to impact on now is diluted. And we are absolutely dominated by time. What's the time? Oh my God, is that the time? Oh my goodness, what's going to happen? Are you going to get time? Oh, I'm going late. And yet, the now is the only thing that exists and time, like space, is a perception. It is part of the construction of reading. You could see time in a way like uh, like a disc, like a, like a DVD. What you've seen in the film is your past, you, as you perceive the past. What you're looking at in the film at that moment you perceive as the present, and what you've yet to see in the film you perceive as the future. Yet all that information exists on that disc at the same time. Whip back a bit, you've gone into the past. Whip forward, you've gone into the future. And I've uh, been talking for years about the time loop, as I call it. 
wrote a book with that title. And it's not really a loop, but it does expre can express itself like that in the play-out world of so-called physical reality. And we go round and round and round, and it comes back to the start. And we think we're going forward, but because we're only in it for a certain section, we think we're going forward. If we stayed with it, it would come basically back to the start. It's like a, a place of experience, and depending on what we wish to experience depends on what part of the, of the loop that we decide to experience. Because, as I said earlier, this vibration... And by the way, this vibration coming out of the black holes vibrates in the now. It doesn't move through time. It, it carries the encoded information that we decode as time, but it vibrates in the now. But it doesn't vibrate just the same forever. It goes through a cycle, a vibrational cycle. Changes. And as it changes, it elicits different information from the suns, which we then decode and as we do so, the world moves on, experience moves on through different epochs. You look at the ancients around the world, and they invariably see time as secular. Uh, you have, of course, the famous yugas in Indian belief, Hindu belief, where the world goes through different cycles. You have a golden age when everything is expansive and everything's fully integrated and connected. And then you have other yugas which are suppressed and you have control and you do not have the expansive awareness that you had before. It's a different kind of experience. And so as this vibration changes, it takes this reality through a cycle and then comes back again. This is where all these yugas come in. And what happens is the left part half of the brain particularly decodes these, this information, which is vibrating in the now, it decodes it into a sequence. It's what some brain scientists call the left brain a serial processor. And it's this sequence that it puts the information in that appears to be the passage of time from past to future. The quicker it decodes it, the quicker time seems to move, the slower it decodes it, the reverse. This is why, as Einstein said, if you're in the company of a beautiful woman, time can uh, pass very quickly, but if you're in a dentist chair, it can pass very slowly because your brain is decoding reality in a different way, putting it into a sequence in a different way. And so the time loop is actually just the decoding of this changing vibration, changing information. And again, if you can hold connection to out there, you can be in the world and not of it. If you're not, you're literally caught in the loop, and that's where most people have been for a very long time. Now, as I say, the, the, the body is a biological computer, and I, I'll get through this per, part pretty quickly because I've been through this uh, before in the talks and stuff, but it's very important to keep connecting the dots. So, the body computer is our vehicle to experience this virtual reality, consciousness to experience it. Um, it's like, you know, you, you want to go to um, experience another planet, you need an outer shell. As I said earlier, we need an outer shell vibrating within the frequency of this reality. And this is what makes racism so ludicrous, so insane, such a confirmation of ignorance. Because it's just a vehicle to experience this reality. And racism is the final confirmation that you are caught in five sense reality and have not a clue of the nature of what we all are, racist and non-racist, and that is consciousness. Humans, we think we're humans, we're, we're human. Humans are like a software program. We're not human. We're experiencing being a human. We are consciousness having that experience. As this uh, article in uh, the San Francisco Chronicle said, DNA is a universal software code. From bacteria to humans, the basic instructions for life are written with the same language. And there are four codes, A, C, G, and T, or in my case, G and T, G and T, G and T. I like that one. It's in my DNA. And how these codes are in relation to each other decides if the outer shell is a human, a mouse, a virus, anything. And it very much connects into those uh, green codes on the computer screens in the Matrix movies. And the body computer, biological computer, has the ability to think and assess for itself, um, ticks every box when you go through it. The reason they're now talking about connecting the brain to desktop computers is because they are connecting two computers. One far more, infinitely more advanced, yes, but two computers. That's how it's possible. Um, when uh, the computer won't work, won't turn on, won't process, we say the computer's dead. 
You drop a computer from a top floor, it will smash and it will be dead. You drop a human computer, it will smash and be dead. Because that's all that happens at death, the computer dies. We don't bloody die. There is no death, we're consciousness, infinite consciousness. The, the computer goes into sleep mode just to tick over. We go into sleep mode just to tick over. We have antivirus technology in computers to seek out the viruses that are a danger to the computer's systems and what you might call health. We have a phenomenal antivirus system we call the human immune system, which does exactly the same. And when you have a, a, a virus system and a new virus comes up, they have to update it because it can't work out how to stop it because it's not been programmed to. This is updated by reacting and then uh, integrating that so that the next time that comes, it can deal with it. This is a, an enhanced uh, photograph taken at the Necker Hospital in Paris when they put tracer dye into the acupuncture points and then photographed it. And the tracer dye went through these lines of energy in the body, the chi, the, 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 the photons. And when you look at it, it's just like a motherboard. And interestingly, when this chi is passing around too slowly or too quickly, the body is ill in some way. And what acupuncture is about is using the uh, needles and other techniques to balance out that flow of energy. And what happens when the information is passing around a desktop computer in less than optimal speed? You say, my bloody computer's slow today, and often it's slow because it has a virus. The brain is the central processing unit of the computer, which in a, in a desktop is a, is a microchip. It's the main processor of information. The DNA is the hard drive, and it's not just the DNA we see physically, because even DNA is just the decoded version of an energy field. Um, we have a, an energy counterpart, which we call the human aura. What we call cultures, I'm this culture, I, I'm, I'm a black South African, I'm a, a Hindu or whatever, these are different sub-softwares of the human software. This guy, William Sheridan, um, was in a New York hospital waiting for a heart transplant and he joined an art therapy course. He was about as good as I am and I'm, I'm a terrible, terrible artist. And this is what he was drawing. After his heart transplant, suddenly he went back on the th art therapy course and started drawing much more sophisticated pictures. As a result of agreeing to promote organ donation, he managed to meet the donor's mother. He asked her the obvious question, did your son of an interest in art, and she said he wanted art materials rather than toys from the age of 18 months. He was crazy about art. And there have been many studies, some of them very extensive over the years, that have shown the incredible uh, connection between people who've received hearts, lungs, and other organs from people, and then taken on either and or their character traits or their abilities. Because what are they doing? They're downloading information from one computer to another. That's how it gets passed across. Credo Mutwa, the great Zulu shaman in South Africa, told me that in the days when they used to eat people in Africa, one of the golden rules was that you must heat the person to a certain temperature, otherwise if you eat them, you become them. Same principle. We are led to believe that what identifies us with the body and what identifies us with the body being us is whether we're a man or a woman. Again, being a man or a woman is not what we are, it's the experience that we're having. How can it, we be a man and a woman, or how can that be what we are, when you can change from a man to a woman through chemical intervention? It's changing the nature of the computer through chemical intervention. Freaky the chicken, who was uh, in the papers a few years ago, started out life as a hen, laying eggs, then had a massive, for some reason, uh, explosion of testosterone and became a cockerel. Started chasing the chickens, uh, the hens, and crowing at dawn. Grew a comb. How can male or female be what we are when that can happen? It's an experience for consciousness which is neither male or female because it's all possibility. This is from the BBC uh, website. Scientists have been able to take control of flies' brains to make females behave just like males. 
Researchers genetically modified the insects so that a group of brain cells that control sexual behavior could be switched on by a pulse of light. The team was able to get female fruit flies to produce a courtship song behavior usually only seen in males. Just so you manipulate the computer. Why do birds suddenly start singing together when the sun comes up? I mean, is there someone with a bat on? Go! Why did Freaky the chicken start crowing at dawn when the testosterone came in? It's a program. It's the same with um, emotions, where we think the emotions are who we are. But you can fundamentally change your emotional state through drugs, through chemicals, through things like mercury. Mercury uh, in, in fillings can change your personality. You can change your personality by drinking the shite in, in, in food and drink, these chemical cocktails. That's what's happening to so many kids. How can, how can even emotions as we know them be what we are? when chemicals can change the emotions that we have. It's to do with the way we decode reality. And uh, we are receiver transmitters of information. Like we're taking from the worldwide cosmic web and we're adding to it. And how interesting and appropriate that one of the great ways or great means of receiving and transmitting is through crystals, quartz crystals. And it turns out the human body is a gigantic liquid quartz crystal. The membrane of every cell, and we have trillions of them, is a quartz crystal, a liquid crystal. The earth is a gigantic crystal. Every grain of sand, for goodness sake, is a crystal. And the earth, too, is receiving and transmitting information within this cosmic web. DNA is a receiver transmitter of information and it's made that way. This is an article on DNA from the characteristic form of this giant molecule, a wound double helix. The DNA represents an ideal electromagnetic antenna. On one hand it is elongated and thus a blade which can take up very well electrical pulses. On the other hand, seen from above, it has the form of a ring and thus is a very magnetical antenna. We are receiving and transmitting all the time through what we think is the body computer. And the energetic auric field connects into us through what we call chakra points, from a word, Sanskrit word meaning wheels of light. And these connect into what we call the physical body through the endocrine uh, system of glands, two of which include the pituitary and the pineal gland, which together make up what we call the third eye. The ability to get out there through the sixth sense. It's like that Muse song says, if you could, we could flick a switch and open your third eye, we would know that they'd never be afraid to die. Words to that effect. Exactly, because we'd be out there. Now, anything that can shut these down holds us in five sense reality and stops us from breaking out into the greater self. That's where they want us and that's where they've got so many people, the vast majority, in that state, in a false identity. The world looks so solid, I grant you, but it can't be. It can't be, even though it seems to be. And if you bang your head on the wall, again, like walking through the fire, believing you're going to get burned, bang, you'll bang your head. But it can't be, because the world is made up of atoms, and as quantum physicists have shown, atoms have no solidity. How can something which is basically empty space make up a solid world? It can't. The reason it appears to is because the information in the waveform metaphysical universe is decoded through into apparent solidity. Again, it's just the way we decode reality that gives it form. We take information from a disk, we put it on the screen, it seems to have time-space solidity, but it doesn't. It's just information being read, and that's exactly what's happening to us. The reason it appears solid and it appears three-dimensional is because we live in a holographic world. We see holograms, you can buy them in the shops, where they appear to be three-dimensional, but actually they're not. It's just the illusion of the way they're made. And how they make them is they have a laser, part of it goes across the object they want to photograph, Another part goes directly onto a photographic plate and then the part that's passed across the object goes onto that plate and they collide. Those two parts of the laser collide and they create, here we go, a wave form. 
We call it in uh, holographics an interference pattern. It's like dropping two pebbles in a pond and then the waves they create collide and that is a waveform representation of where those pebbles fell, how heavy they were, how high they fell from, etc., how big they were, etc. And this is what the waveform again looks like on a holographic print. It's information. It seems to be nothing. It looks like a fingerprint, appropriately actually. But what is it? But you fire a laser at that and suddenly a three-dimensional and the best of them a very solid looking image comes up. This is our, we create our reality. It's holographic. This guy um, is in an, in an Australian city, I think it was Melbourne, but he was projected as a hologram onto a stage in Adelaide. This is one that CNN did. So we are creating a holographic uh, version of this information, just like a hologram does in our heads. That's where it comes from, it's this construct. And how funny, I've been saying this for years, and then um, I come across this very, very mainstream New Scientist magazine uh, in January now 2009, and its front page, you are a hologram projected from the edge of the universe. You don't need to go through great swathes of academia. In fact, it's, 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 it's often the worst thing that can happen, because it puts you in, 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 in the box on the postage stamp, often, to understand reality. You just have to access that which is all around us, containing that knowledge. And then you have the question, how can something be a waveform and a particle at the same time, which is what quantum physics has, has found and gone, what? How can that be? Very simple. When you're creating a hologram, the waveform doesn't disappear when the hologram uh, projects itself. They both exist at the same time, the information construct and the decoded uh, holographic form. The particle and the waveform exist at the same time. It's so bloody simple. People think it's so complex. One of the great things about a hologram is that every part of the hologram is a smaller version of the whole. So if you cut a holographic print into four and put a laser onto the four pieces, you don't get a quarter size version of the whole picture uh, or quarter size part of the whole picture, you get a quarter size version of the entire picture. And because of that, this is why these things happen. This is why reflexologists can find points on the hand and the feet and elsewhere that relate to different organs and parts of the body. This is how uh, acupuncture can do it and, and reflexology with, with the points on the ear. Do something here, it affects the heart. Do something here, it affects the liver. Because it's a hologram, and it must be like that, because every part of the hologram is a smaller part of the whole. Holographic Blood, this uh, book by uh, uh, an American physician called Harvey Biggleton, I went to see. He has found um, holographic images in the blood. And I looked uh, through one of his m really powerful microscopes, and <laughs> As he increased it and increased it and increased it, my blood went from blood as you would perceive it to quartz crystal when you, you, you got it to the most powerful level. That's what we are, crystals. So because we live in a holographic reality where everything is a smaller version of the whole, that's where we get this, the theme of as above, so below. That's why the human energy field is mirrored by the earth energy field. Because we are a smaller part of the Earth hologram, and the Earth hologram is a smaller part of the greater hologram. And on one level, this reality is digital. And they're creating now, and this is extremely relevant to what I've been saying, they're creating now digital holograms that operate in a slightly different way to the holograms we've had before. And some of these digital holograms, that's one, are being used at um, promotions to sell products and stuff. And people are frightened to walk through the hologram because it looks so solid. And that's what this is, digital holograms. Digital holograms is the reality that we're experiencing in what I call the play out world. And this is why uh, numbers, numerology works. Numerology can um, predict things and it can make things happen because it is working on this digital level of reality. 
Computers work on binary systems of on-off electrical charges, just symbolized as one and naught. They're now starting to develop um, trinary computers with a third number. And the human brain works how? On binary and trinary on-off, etc., electrical charges. And of course, the uh, AC, G, and C codes of the DNA are all connect into this. So while in the Matrix movies we saw the projection of beyond the physical world, it was a digital world, so is ours, that's exactly what it is. And like I say, scientists are not sussing any of this stuff in terms of the mainstream because they focus on their own discipline, their own individual dot, and they don't connect the dots, and therefore they can't see the picture. I watched a, um, I watched a program the other day. It was a mainstream science program, and it asked the question for at least an hour, I think it was an hour, what's the biggest number? And they were going to these bloody numbers that went on and on and on and on, disappearing up there, trying to work it out. Well, I'll tell you the biggest number. That's the biggest number. Infinity. There is no biggest number. There is only all possibility. And numbers are the digital level of this reality. And because of that, numbers represent vibrational states. As a result of that, you can manipulate reality through numbers and numerology. Because you're manipulating that level of the decoded construct. So what, does all construct. so what does all this mean? We live a false identity. We think we're humans when we're consciousness. We're multi-leveled awareness. Not just the body, consciousness. And uh, some near-death experiences have experienced and then come back to tell the story of what um, they've experienced when they've been through, sometimes they experience it as a tunnel, and then come back when their body releases the consciousness for a short time. And this is one that encapsulates all of it. He said, everything from the beginning, my birth, my ancestors, my children, my wife, everything comes together simultaneously. I saw everything about me and about everyone who was around me. I saw everything they were thinking now, what they thought then, what was happening before, what was happening now. There is no time, there is no sequence of events, no such thing as limitation of distance, of period, of time, of place. I could be anywhere I wanted to be simultaneously. This body computer is what gives us the delusion of all those things. And I'll just finish on this bit. Key to holding us in servitude is to keep us in the left hemisphere of the brain. We have two, the right brain, the left brain, and we have a bridge called the corpus callosum, which bridges the two and should pass information between the two. And the right brain, they are very, very different uh, states of being. The right brain is the out there, the creative, the connection with all that is. The left brain is what deals in numbers, in language, in sequence, and puts everything in hierarchical structures and all the rest of it. And what the system wants, is wants us in there. Because when we're in there and not in there, we are there. And the whole system is structured to put us there. The education system, everything. I found this, different functions of the right and left brain. What the right brain uh, wants to do is say the color. What the left brain wants to do, language, it wants to say the word. And it's interesting when you try to go through these and say the color, how difficult it is for many people to say the color instead of the word, to say green instead of what the left brain wants, which is yellow. And the functions of the two are massively different. This lady, um, a brain scientist, neuroanatomist called Jill Bolte Taylor, became well known when she had a stroke in the 1990s, I think it was. And she had a stroke in the left brain and stayed awake for most of it, and therefore experienced what was happening. First of all, she got onto an exercise bike trying to overcome how she was feeling, and she looked down at her hands, because this left brain decoding system is now not working, and was not decoding reality as it normally did. She looked down, and she saw not hands, she saw claws. As this went on, she could no longer see a division between her and anything else. Everything just joined as one infinite field of energy consciousness. And she said it was just bliss. 
Nirvana, she called it. When she tries, eventually, the left brain eventually kicks in and says, you've got to get help. She tries to call work, a colleague, to help her out. Took her 45 minutes, I think she said, a long time, trying to go through these business cards to find the number because when she looked at them, she couldn't see numbers and words anymore because this wasn't decoding reality as it should. She could see pixels. She was seeing this reality one step back in its digital pixel state. Eventually, through following the squiggles, she says, she managed to ring the number. And when the guy, he must have said something on the other end, like, hello, all she heard, she said, when he picked the phone up, was woof, 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 woof. And then she said, I, I tried to say to him, um, hey, this is Jill, I'm in trouble. And all she heard herself say was woof, 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 woof. Because the vibration was not being decoded by the left brain, the language part, into words that we can um, understand. And what the system wants to do is to put these firewalls up called education, science, politics, media, peer pressure, to keep the right brain out of it. And this is fundamental because uh, these things are all part of the defense mechanism keeping us in left brain reality and out of right brain infinity. Now some people, they call them um, autistic savants, like this man Stephen Wilshire. They access the right brain potential in ways that other people don't. And this is why they're capable of fantastic achievements. This guy, Stephen Wiltshire, was taken up in a helicopter over London by the BBC for half an hour with nothing except his eyes and then came down and drew London from the air with incredible um, accuracy. Why? Because he was accessing that infinite potential that left brain people, most of people in the world don't. This guy, Daniel Tammet, another autistic savant, has, has, has again achieved incredible things because um, he was challenged once to learn Icelandic in a week and it's an incredibly difficult language to learn. I mean, none of the media were, dis were, were using on their news reading, uh, were using the real name of that volcano in Iceland, were, were they? Because they could bloody pronounce it. This guy went back on television a week later speaking Icelandic. And his Icelandic teacher said, he's not human. Yes, he is. It's the human that we once were and will be again when this suppression of our potential and our infinite possibility is brought to an end and this shite stops. We worship the intellect. Oh, he's got a great mind. Oh, he did this at Oxford. Oh, he's gone to Harvard. Mind is such a low level of awareness. It's supposed to be a vehicle for experiencing this reality, a servant of consciousness. It's become our master. It's become something to worship. And that's the isolated intellect. That's the isolated intellect. And so we reach a point. This fork in the road is, are we going to be consciousness or mind? Are we going to be all that is or little me? It's not really free your mind, it's free yourself from mind. That's why society is structured to completely engross us and swamp us in things to occupy our mind. Open your mind, become all that is. Infinite love is the only truth, everything else is illusion. What is infinite love? All possibility, infinite possibility. Choice between the head, thinking, intellect, and the heart, knowing wider consciousness. Then we start to access this wider information and see the world from a completely different level. We then start to access, once we get out of mind, all these other realities, 
that are there to be accessed and perceived and to glean insight and information from that have been denied by being encloseted and enclosed in mind. As William Blake said, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. The control system's game is not to have that cleanse happen. René Descartes, the French uh, mathematician and philosopher, defining who we are, said, I think, therefore I am. I would update that on the body computer level and say, I compute, therefore I am. But beyond that, in the realms of consciousness, it is simply, I am, therefore I am. I am all that is, has been, and ever will be. And this multi-level conspiracy is there to keep that knowledge from us, to hold us in little me mental states, so a tiny few can control billions. Without this knowledge, we cannot understand the conspiracy and how it works. And the question is, who's behind it? See, they're hiding already. Who's behind it? And that's what we'll get to in the next section, which will start in uh, 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you.